Hi, everybody, and welcome to Find My Pass From Home. I hope you're doing well, and I'm really excited to be back. This is my first uh, session back with you guys since um, I was on my holiday break. So I hope everybody had a lovely Christmas and a really, really great New Year's. Uh, and um, we're really excited to talk about advanced search techniques today on Find My Past. Um, so I am Jen Baldwin. I am the Data Acquisition Manager for North America for Find My Past. And it is so great to have you all back with us. Ellie's here in the comments. Um, so thank you, Ellie. It's my first time using our new awesome format for live streaming, and I'm really excited about it. Um, so it is so good to see you guys. Please comment and let us know where you're at and where you're from and what's happening in your world. I'm currently in the state of Colorado, um, almost Wyoming, very close to the Wyoming border. It's supposed to be in the 50s today. I don't remember what that converts to in Celsius, but it's very warm for January. So I'm really excited. I'm gonna take a nice long walk with my dog when we're done. Okay, so we've got some people saying hello. Linda's with us. Thank you for being with us, Linda. Rachel from Missouri, that's fantastic. Roz is in Massachusetts. It's good to be back, Roz, thank you. Um, we've got Daphne in Somerset and Aileen from Scotland. And wow, these are going coming in fast and furious. This is so great. Um, Janet's in South Africa, another Janet in North Wales. Um, Dorothy is from Scotland, but lives in Rome. That's pretty awesome. Um, that's got to be pretty good. Linda is in dull and damp, but not cold in Salisbury. <laughs> that's good. Um, Jeff is in Devon. Linda's in the UK on over on our YouTube stream. Hillary is in North Wales. It's very gray. Um, I've never been to Wales, but I would imagine that it's usually pretty gray. I don't know. I'm just um, talking about stereotypes, I guess. Uh, Ron is in Illinois, Marie in Manchester. We've got Bristol. We've got Aberdeenshire. We've got, oh, who did I miss? Shirley is in Essex. Good morning from Oregon. Good morning. Who said that? Oh, this scrolls by so quick. I love it. Okay. This is so good. All right. Um, oh, Robin's in Oregon. So we have at least two people from Oregon. Fantastic. Roz, it's us. It's 2.30 in the morning in Australia. What are you doing? <laughs> um, okay. This is so great. Thank you so much. Oh, Jeff says Wales is always wet. Thanks, Jeff. Um, okay. So we're going to talk about advanced search techniques today. And I hope that this session proves helpful to everybody, whether you have been researching for 20 years or you have been researching for 24 hours. Um, this session is kind of designed to showcase um, all these features that are built on the Find My Pass site. And the primary thing, one of the primary things that I want you to take away from today's session is that we are doing everything we can to put you in the driver's seat. Um, you are the researcher. You are the one who is in control of what you're looking at and what you want to, to obtain from the site and from the resource, from the collection. Um, so all of these tools are designed to put you in charge. Um, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of technology out there today, especially, right? And we see it all the time now with um, computer automation and um, advanced technology kind of thinking for us, right? But the whole objective here is that um, Find My Past is one tool in your toolkit. It is not the researcher. The computer is not the genealogist, right? It's up to you to make the decisions as, as to whether a record is appropriate or fits in, in what you're trying to solve. Um, so we're going to we're going to kind of approach everything with that mindset um, today. So make sure that you're, you're kind of constantly thinking about the fact that you're in charge of this research process. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so you guys can see. And oh, look, that looks so snazzy. Ellie, I love this tool. This is great. She's smiling, but you guys can't see her. OK, um, so we're going to talk about advanced search techniques on Find My Past. Now I'm gonna hit what I think are the things that people should know about the site. Um, but some of you may have been using the website longer than me, to be honest. Um, so if you have a suggestion or if you have something that you you think people should know about or some little trick that you've picked up, absolutely feel free to share it in the comments. What I'm gonna share with you today is not everything. Um, there are so many ways to solve a genealogical research problem. Um, and this is just some of the things that I prefer to, to really kind of talk about and and, and uh, 
focus on when I give top, you know, when I when I talk about things like this. Um, but you may have developed something else. And so please do share those comments. Um, just a couple more. Uh, let's see, Pat is in London. Uh, Steve is in Yorkshire. Amanda has a brick wall, her Welsh three times great grandmother, her baptism and parents. That's that's a tough one. Um, Denise is saying me too. Um, let's see, Audrey's with us, Grand and Drizzly as per usual. Um, it's so it's so good to, to see all of you guys and it's so good to have um, have you guys all back. All right, so let's jump into this. Now, one of the first things um, that I'm gonna start with actually is um, thinking about what you should do before you actually log in to find my past. Um, and we're just going to kind of cover this really quickly, but it's, it's important, especially if you are working on a more complex um, problem, uh, a genealogical problem or a big research project, right? Take the time, even if it's just 10 minutes, create a research plan so you know what your objectives and goals are review all those possible sources, right? So, and I'll show you this a little bit towards the end. I always start by making a list of the possible records that I might be able to use, whether they're online or offline. Um, and you can do that in a variety of ways. And I'll, I'll show you a sample in a little bit. You wanna create a timeline of the ancestor in question with what you already know or what you believe to be true. Make sure that you can add to it as you go though. Make sure it's something that's really easy to edit. So for me, I, I prefer to use Excel for most of this um, because it's really easy to insert a new line into an Excel spreadsheet and it's really easy to sort the data, right? So I make a column for the year and the date and, and whatever information I'm trying to seek um, and I fill in everything that I can. Um, as I'm doing that, I'm thinking about the decades that he lived in, the history that that person might have experienced, um, major events ac across the world, right? So if I'm researching someone during the course of World War I, I make sure that all of those important dates are included into their timeline. So it's not just when they were born, when they got married, and when they died. It's much more complex. It's a much m broader look at kind of social and world global history, as well as regional history. I don't write down everything, obviously, but as much as I think is important for me to keep my keep my mind on. Um, the fourth thing is to write all of this down, right? Take the time to actually document your research plan, pull out some objectives, think about what is it you want to know and prioritize that list. Um, and you wanna review that every time you start a research session. So you know exactly what you're looking for, right? So my first priority is to, is to figure out the exact death, date, and location of my third times great-grandfather, okay? That's your goal, that's your, your, your objective. Everything you do in that research session should be about that goal. Everything else that you find, all those little you know, threads we wanna pull on as we research, it just goes into that document. If you write as you research, you will never lose an idea or a possible record that you stumble upon while you're looking for something else. And we know we know that feeling, right? That happens to all of us. But if you document everything, if you write as you research and you just keep writing and you see I've got on the screen, right? Keep writing and then write some more. I never stop writing. I constantly have some kind of writing tool in front of me whenever I'm researching. Okay, so that's just a quick review about kind of setting yourself up for success a little bit, but let's spend the majority of our time together today on, on the Find My Past site. So Find My Past offers a variety of search options. And again, we do this to put you in the driver's seat. So you want to make sure that you utilize and understand all of these different um, options that are available to you. You can search all records, which is kind of a generic blanket search. You can do an advanced search, a category search, an all records search. Um, and then we have a variety of filters uh, that you can apply to those searches. And we're gonna walk through a couple examples here. So hopefully you guys all have an account on Find My Past. If you don't, um, that free account is actually um, well worth it. Uh, sign up for a free account if you don't have one already, um, because you can do some exploration on the site with that, with that free account and you can get emails and that kind of thing. So there are a handful of ways to approach this. Now, this is what it looks like when you log in to Find My Past, right? This is our dashboard page. And keep in mind that mine might look a little bit differently than yours. And the reason for that for most of you is gonna be location, right? I'm located in the United States. So the site automatically filters me to the .com version. There's no difference in the record collection. There's just a few differences in terms of design and, and how we put things in front of you um, based on what's important for that region. 
So there's a variety of ways that you can enter into a search from here. Now, the first and most obvious one is just to search all records. That's certainly something that you can do. Note that it automatically navigates you to your location. So for me, that's United States and Canada. Um, I can also select the advanced search link down underneath the search button. That will also point me to United States and Canada records. So for me, when I'm starting a research project, and especially right now, because I'm in the midst of a big one, um, that's all pretty much focused between the United States, Canada, and England, um, I actually go through the top navigation bar. And the reason I do that is because it immediately points me to world records. Now, um, if I wanted to search world records through either of these other options, it's just one click, right? It's not like it's difficult to get to world records. But if you add up the number of extra clicks that you you take in a research session, you might be surprised how much time you spend clicking around on a website. So for me, efficiency is important, right? I wanna make the most of my research time. I don't wanna spend a bunch of time navigating around the site. I want to research. So every chance I have to save myself a click, I'm going to take. So I start at the top menu bar. Um, when you click on that, this is, you get this drop dropdown. Um, it's, um, it, there's a lot of opportunities here. So you can search all records. You can go to the all record sets page, which is essentially the card catalog of Find My Past. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, or you can search by category. And I've got newspapers and periodicals in the 1939 register circled here because they are special. <laughs> um, you can search those resources through the search all records page or a, a global search page, um, but it's easier to get to them if you go into their category specifically. So if you decide that tomorrow you're gonna sit down and you're gonna spend an hour studying newspapers, then go directly to the newspaper and periodical category. It will save you a couple of clicks, which saves you time. Okay, so when you click on search records, this is what you get. You come to the world records page. And for those of us who've been using genealogy websites for a while, um, this is relatively standard, right? It looks like there's a lot of options here. Um, and we're gonna walk through a handful of examples, but I wanna introduce you to the person we're gonna use as that example first. Now, if you've seen any of my other sessions, you are already familiar with this individual. Uh, John Horatio Lawrence is my current research project. Um, he and everything that's on the screen, I know from oral history that was passed down through the family. So possibly born in Birmingham. Um, his father was a silversmith. We think he might have served in the English army, his immigration, his marriage, his children, and so forth. So um, at this point, I, I believe that he had a total of 10 children. Right. So there's a lot of kids kind of spread across Pennsylvania and, and Ohio, and then they end up in Nebraska and um, his wife ends up in Colorado. So the, the family has a very kind of standard and typical migration pattern through the United States. What my research plan is currently focused on is actually where John originates from. Um, so who were his parents? Was he really born in the Birmingham area? Do I have his birth date right? And so forth. So that's what I'm really focused on in terms of my particular research strategy today. So let's go back to the site, world records. Um, on this search, I'm gonna start really big and broad and I'm gonna take it one step at a time to narrow down my results. So in this case, I've only put in his name, John Lawrence, and I've checked the name variance box on his surname. Now keep in mind, for those of you who, who don't look at that very often, um, the name variance surname box is not automatically selected for you on Find My Past. You have to manually select that if you want to use it. And there are strategies um, to use it and to not use it. So um, think about that as you conduct your searches. And one of my favorite features about Find My Past actually is just this blue but button down at the bottom of the screen. It tells me in just one, what, without clicking anywhere, without having to actually click on search or view the results, how many uh, results I have come back on this, on this particular search. So this is looking in all of our records across the world for a man named John Lawrence. No dates, no locations, no categories, no nothing. I have three, 361,000 results, way too many right? <laughs> if you have time for 361,000 results, um, I have a couple things I need you to do for me. <laughs> um, so I'm going to keep going. I'm going to continue to um, navigate through the search. And I have a lot of options to do that. I can use the categories. I can add in more information. I can use all these little links. Um, uh, uh, 
and tools that are built into the page so that you can see all of the variations and all of the ways that Find My Past um, gives you to control your search. So I'm just going to, I'm not even going to click search yet, right? I'm going to change it. I'm going to filter it to just English records because that's what I'm most interested in. Um, so it automatically puts me down, down to 177,000 results. I've just cut it by about two thirds. So that's a really good first step. I'm also going to, oh, I thought I had circles on this one. I'm sorry, I don't think I do. I added in uh, Birmingham, Warwickshire, Warwickshire uh, and his year of birth is 1806. And I'm now down to 721 results, which still sounds like a lot, but we're making big progress um, from the original 360,000, whatever it was. So the idea that I'm trying to to convey is start really broad and take the time step by step to funnel each level of your filters. Now, when I do this, I'm actually documenting every step that I take and how I actually conducted the search. I'm going to show you that at the end. Right. So that takes us to, oh, there's my circles. I got them. All right. 721 results. Now, eventually I get down to filtering to just birth, marriage, and death or parish registers. That's the category that I'm in now. And I'm down to 178 results, which is much more realistic. Now, there's a couple of things on this page I want to point out. And the first one is the um, icons on the side. If you're relatively new to Find My Past, you will see that every search result comes back with those icons. Now, everything has the little piece of paper icon. Um, that's what we call the index or the transcription entry, depending on where you're located. You click on that and you get as much information as we can provide to you. If it has that second icon, the little picture graphic, that means that there is an image of the record in that result, in that search result. So you always want to go to the original image whenever possible. Sometimes those images might be the actual record itself, digitized and preserved online. Sometimes it is a picture of an index or a book uh, or some other published work. Um, so make sure that you track each of those tools, right? So if it is a picture of an index, where did the index come from? Someone sat down with the original collection at some point in history and wrote out that index. So track each source all the way back to the original image whenever possible. Jenny is correcting me on my pronunciation. I know, Jenny, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I mess it up every time. I'm working on it, I promise. Um, I really, really am. There's some locations across England and Wales that I just simply won't attempt yet, um, but I'm, I'm working on it. All right. Um, <laughs> but I saw that comment come through and I just couldn't help it. I have to acknowledge that one. Okay. So, um, I'm in my parish register results and I'm looking at all my search results and I'm seeing that maybe this isn't exactly quite what I'm looking for. Something that isn't working, one of my filters isn't right. I don't have to go back to the search page. I can make all of those changes right here in the search results page, which I love because again, it's saving me some clicks. It's saving me some time. Um, so I can make those edits and changes directly from this screen. And if I need to, I can go back to that advanced options button and filter the search from the beginning. Um, Again, just to really emphasize those changes, right? I can make the change really quickly. So in this case, I'm still looking for John Lawrence. I changed it from year of birth, 1806, to year of death, 1840, because I believe his father's name was John, and I believe he died around 1840, um, give or take five years. Um, um, so it the changes the results a little bit, but it allows me to continue through my research process. And most importantly, maybe for me, it it allows me to continue the research without breaking my stream of thought, right? I don't have to manipulate the website to follow along with what my brain is trying to, to come up with. Um, I can manipulate the site through the search results. So I don't break that kind of stream of, you know, when you get into a research session and you're really deep down into it and, and all you can think about is that next step and that next clue and something strikes you and you go, oh, maybe that's it. This allows you to change your search immediately without having to click around. So you can see I'm, I'm at 113 results on this one, um, looking for the death instead of the birth. Okay, and then on the side, there's these little boxes and we have the icons that I showed you on the last screen. Now there's little pink check marks and that means that I've looked at it before in some capacity. This really helps me quite a lot. And I think that there are people who love these little check marks and there are people who maybe don't. Um, but for me, these go into my research plan. So as I'm tracking the type of search I'm conducting and the records that I look at, I know without a fact, without doubt, that if I miss one of those or if I get really caught 
up in what I'm doing and I forget to document it, I can very quickly recreate my search and go back to what I've looked at and document that for myself. Um, whereas with other sites, it's a lot of you know clicking back on the browser button and hoping that you'll get to what that thing was that you forgot to write down. Um, so for me, these check marks are really, really useful. Okay. Let's talk about category searches. It's a more targeted search. Um, it's also accessible via the top menu bar, just about everything is, um, or through the search pages um, within, within your progression on the site. So let's take a look at those. So from that top menu bar, you can select a variety of categories. We have eight primary categories on Find My Pass, and each one has its subsequent uh, subcategories, which we'll get to in a second. So you might be looking specifically for institutes and organizations, right, or um, immigration and travel information. You can direct your, your research time directly to those, those types of records. When you're looking at the world records page, you can do this in a number of ways. They're along the left-hand side. They're included in the um, in the main part of the screen. So you can click on that little blue browse category or subcategory record set, and it will bring up a list for you. So there's a number of ways that you can approach this. So in this case, I'm going to look at education and work. I'm still looking for John Lawrence. Um, I believe that his father was a silversmith, and he may or may not have served an apprenticeship um, before he left England. Um, but as soon as I click on that category, the site changes, right? Everything adapts a little bit. So at the top, I get a little blurb about education and work records. At the bottom, I get an option to learn more about this type of record for a variety of locations. And I get the useful links and resources. All of this automatically updates when you select the category. And it's really good information. Um, there's a lot at the bottom of the screen. So on just about every page on Find My Pass, you can scroll down and get that kind of contextual how to helpful information. It's really important to understand the context in which the records were created, why those records even exist in the first place in order to make the best use of them. And so you want to make sure that you're reading through that material. So my search is um, pretty straightforward. I've got John Lawrence um, in, in England. I have 28 results in the education and work category. Um, and I can do a lot with this page as well. Um, um, sorry, let's go ahead and filter though to subcategories. Allows you to be even more specific and search multiple record sets at once, which is really helpful. Saves you again a lot of time. They can reveal also extra search fields and I'm gonna show you an example of that in our military records. Most of our military service uh, records from the British Army carry that service number in the actual, we've indexed it, right? So you can search on that service number and we'll take a look at that. So if I go back to my education and work um, search, I'm again, I'm looking for John Lawrence um, in, in this particular category. I'm actually gonna filter it to the apprentices um, subcategory to see what happens, right? See how I do, um, because there is a theory that he served an apprenticeship. I actually end up with only four results, which for me is great because um, I can immediately discount two of these, right? Because they occurred in the 1600s and he wasn't alive yet. And then there are two that have a potential, you know, that need to be investigated um, just based on the search results themselves. Um, so that's a, that's a great search for me because I've I've not given myself too many results. I've given myself a number of results that's perfectly manageable. So for me, this is a very positive result. I don't want to be overwhelmed. I don't want a thousand or 500,000 results back on every search. I want to be, get very specific on the details of his life. Um, so I've changed it up a little bit just to give you a slightly different example. In this case, we're looking at um, John Lawrence potentially died in 1840, um, 841 results in um, across all of England. Um, but just to keep out and point out those categories and subcategories, you can, if you scroll down on that search results page, um, you will see the categories listed. And when you click on one of these and open it up, you get all the subcategories. And this is how you might search different categories or subcategories at the same time. So if I wanted to look at burials and wills and probate, I have the option to select both of those subcategories and search for them consecutively. And I would get, um, what is it, 12, 14 results back. Look at me doing math live on camera, that's fun. Um, so out of those 14 results, I can then examine those records and identify if any of them are applicable. All right, I, want, I do want to talk a little bit about that subcategory with a special search. And I'm going to actually start with looking at military service and conflict, but looking at the country level, right? So um, if I start looking for um, 
American military records on the Find My Past site. There are actually quite a few of them, but they're indexed exactly as is shown on the record. So of the country locations, I have America, British America, North America, USA, United States of America, United States, USA with all spaces. Um, and then I'm also looking at prison ships in this particular search. Um, and in this case, one of the records has a typo and it says United States, but it's indexed that way because that's what it says on the record, right? We, we don't change what the record displays. We index it exactly as it's stated on the record. So I need to make sure I include the typos and the assumptions in my, in my search as well. So in this case, I'm actually looking for someone who's involved in um, the War of 1812, uh, is how it's referred to in, Amer in the States, um, between the United States and Britain primarily. Now for Britain, for England, that was a part of a much larger kind of global military campaign that was happening all at the same time. So the War of 1812 records for Americans are kind of tucked away in these other military records. So I'm going to look at um, anything that indicates in terms of location um, where I might find Americans in those British military records. So when I go to my search results page, you see all of those locations listed on the left-hand side so that you can continue to edit. You can take some out. Um, you can continue to add however you want to manipulate the search. On this page, I find two that look interesting, but they also look very similar, right? So are these actually different records? Well, you need to, again, examine the original record every time to make sure that you know what you're looking at. Um, in this case, we're going to compare the transcriptions as well. Um, so the main differences here are that that um, the location is listed as either NH or New Hampshire, spelled out, um, America versus United States. But most importantly, perhaps, is the archival reference number. And we can see very easily that these are, in fact, two different records come from two different sets of material at the National Archives in Q. So when we go to the images, we have one example with Jacob Brown listed at the top. Our second example is a different document with Jacob Brown listed. It's the same person, but it's two different records. So we need to make sure that we're evaluating records in that sense and, and very carefully. Now, we talked about special search filters that are created for particular record sets. In the military collection, you can search by regiment or you can search by soldier number. Um, you will not see those search fields, obviously, on parish records because they don't apply. But if you go into the military service and conflict category, you will find those search filters. Uh, and this allows us to, of course, type in um, um, any one of those uh, pieces of information. So in this example, which I'm back to my John Lawrence, um, I have found a record of a John Edward Lawrence. So it's not the right John Lawrence, but it does have his service number at the top, actually in two different places. Um, so make sure that you're reading and understanding everything on the document to ensure that you are finding that service number. And then I can go back and put that into my search box where it says service number in military records and find everything related to that number. Doesn't necessarily have to be related to John Edward Lawrence, but it will find everything across the site, even if the document is torn and we can't see the full last name and it's not indexed uh, in, in its entirety, um, we can find it through the service record number. Okay. So all record sets, um, and I hope you guys are okay with the time. I'm definitely not going to finish in an hour. <laughs> um, okay, so all record sets is a relatively new um, adaption to the site. It used to be the A to Z of records, and which was more of along the lines of a card catalog. All record sets kind of combines the, the idea of a card catalog with um, with your favorite search engine and allows you to search for keywords or exact searches um, really from any records across the site. Um, so if you haven't played with this recently, um, I don't remember exactly when we released this change, but um, it's um, not too old. I don't remember for sure. Okay, so all record sets. Um, again, it will automatically filter to a location based on where you are um, in the world. So if you're in England or in, in the UK, your location field on the where drop down menu is going to be, I believe, the UK. If you're in Ireland, I believe it's Ireland. Everywhere else, it's world, um, which is great. I think that's great. 
helpful for me. So um, note right away that the records are in alphabetical order um, and by the number of records in every collection. So the first thing I see because I'm in the US is the United States Marriages Collection um, with over 246 million entries. Your view might look a little bit different. It might filter differently for you based on where you are in the world today. You can filter by country, by county, the name of the record set, the record category, and in some cases, the provider, although that's relatively limited. So if I wanted to search for all the records from Canada, I would simply just change that drop down to, to Canada and the list changes for me. So I know exactly what is available to me on the site. Now, remember at the beginning, I talked about creating a list of possible records that you could look at. This is the type of work that I'm, that I'm referring to. Um, when you're starting a project, think about his lifespan, right? He was born in 1830 and he died in 1910. And so I'm going to look in all of the censuses every decade until he, he passes away. Um, and I'm going to make a list of all those censuses. So I know when I've checked it, I can just check it off my list, right? Um, if I'm unfamiliar with the records that are available for that area, I'm going to go to this type of a page on any of the genealogy providers and say, what are the records avail available to me for Canada? I can even narrow it down. I can say, okay, I'm going to expand my search into Ontario, specifically when I look at Ontario records. Um, what is What are my options? What's available to me? I'm going to make that list before I ever put a name into the website so that I know what my options are, I know where my research can lead me. And I know what's online and what's not, which can be crucially important. We can also search the All Record Sets page by topic or keyword. So in this case, I've searched for the word Catholic because Find My Past has a massive Catholic collection from around the world. So I get everything on the site that has something to do with the Catholic faith. And there are um, a number of these on the, on the screen that you can see that are location specific, but there are also a number of results that um, are more social history, right? Like, you know, Catholic his history across various locations. Um, uh, another feature that I particularly like about this page is that I can filter my search by category and subcategory. So if I want to get Catholic records that are census related, I can filter the category search. So census pops up to the top of the list and I have all of the available options to me, like the 1893 Westminster census um, of, for the, from the Roman Catholics. Um, that is, by the way, a really wonderful record set. There's some great little notations in the margins. If you've never looked at it, it's, it's worth a look. You can also search by just kind of any keyword you can think of. So punch in whatever you're, you're working on and see if anything pops up. And if it says no results, just keep in mind that we continually add to this system. So um, if we see somebody searching for something over and over again and we have records related to that, we're going to kind of do that work in the background. Um, so in this case, I've um, searched for the word prisoner and I get all of the results from around the world that have anything to do with prisoner records. Now, I mentioned at the, um, when I started this section, you can search by the repository or the partner that we got the records from. And that is true for a couple of specific organizations in the United States. So the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society and the Historical Society of Pennsylvania all have the name of the organization um, keyed into this search process. Um, so if you know you're looking for a record from the New York Genealogical and Biographical Society, you can just start typing in New York Genealogical and it will filter the list for you. All right, one other search feature from Find My Past that is unique and um, and needs to be utilized regularly in your search pattern is the location search. Now, this is only available on UK record sets uh, today, but this little radius bar, it doesn't look like much, but it is a very powerful tool. And let me show you why. So especially if you're unfamiliar with an area you're researching, right, you might end up in something like this. So this site is maps.familysearch.org and it um, has a variety of maps from across the UK. I think actually I want to say it's just England, but I may, oh yeah, it is. It's England jurisdictions. Um, and it's a fantastic tool. It allows me to see parishes, counties, civil registration districts, provinces, poor law unions, dioceses, whatever I want on the map all simultaneously. So I can say, oh, all the parishes of the Birmingham area um, at one time, right? And this is really helpful, especially if you don't understand or you're not familiar with the geography of the space you're researching in. But these are all man-made jurisdictions, right? Um, and we know that our ancestors didn't necessarily stick to that. If there was a major river that they had to cross between their house 
and the parish in their actual, you know, designated location, they may not take that route. They may go to the parish in the next county over because they don't have to cross a major river to get there. Maybe it's just easier or it's actually closer, even though it's in a different county. So we we took all of that concept, that idea of these man-made jurisdictions, and we said, well, maybe the ancestors didn't actually behave that way. And we put in this radius search. So you'll see it on all of the search screens. Um, in this case, I'm looking again, of course, for my John Lawrence. I've moved the search radius miles up to the 10 level mark around Warwickshire, Warwickshire County. Um, I hope I got it right that time. Um, so it takes the middle point, according to kind of GPS data, and it says stretch my search out 10 miles from that central location. And as you can see in the search results, I end up getting a possible results back from other counties. Now, if I'm unfamiliar with that territory, which when I started this project, I very much was, um, I would not have immediately thought to look in these other locations. Um, but if you, it's kind of like looking at a map in a really, really pinpointed area and then zooming out and going, well, wait a second, what are the opportunities that surround us? Um, but the, the search guys have just kind of made that tool available to us um, so that we don't actually have to zoom out on the map. The computer kind of does it for us. Um, so that's a really, really great tool um, for searching across the UK. And one of the theories and, and misconceptions that we hear a lot in British and Irish genealogy is that my ancestors didn't really move around very much, but actually they kind of did. And that's one of the reasons why this search radius tool was created. Um, it's usually, their travels was usually kind of contained within a radius of 20 miles or less. And that's why we have the 5, 10, 20 markers on that radius tool. Many of them were farm laborers or seasonal workers, so they had to move to wherever the work was. Um, and we know that in the 18th century, almost half of the population did not die in the parish in which they were born. So this search radius tool can be incredibly powerful. Now, of course, on just about every genealogy provider, you can do wildcard searches. And this can be a huge difference between success and failure. So I encourage you to use them often, um, use them on all the sites that you use for your research um, and, and get used to them, right? So on Find My Past, wildcards are indicated with either a question mark or an asterisk. Question mark is a letter that could be anything at all. So a, an example might be the RYL of a surname and you put in the question mark, which could represent an A, an O, an E, and so forth, okay? You might use the asterisk wild card, and that's when you don't know if there are letters there at all, how many they might there might be, or what those letters might be. So in this case, we're going to use Miko's last name um, of Cleland, right? We know how it's spelled, but maybe the records captured it with an A, um, an L, a second L, an O, um, or um, a possibly a second L and an O. You can also use the asterisk um, in particular definitions, right? Or, or, or words, phrases. Um, so we might look at the term of coal, right? You could have coal miner, uh, coal hewer, coal mine worker, and so forth. So those asterisks and question marks can be really, really powerful. And again, we just encourage you to use those across every site that you encounter. So putting this into practice for my, my John Lawrence example, um, I've got John and his Lawrence surname is spelled L-A with a question mark and then an R. Um, I do have his year of birth and a location. I have 133 results on that search um, because Lawrence can be spelled in a variety of ways, right? And I can conduct this search in a number of different variations to get all the possibilities of results coming back to me. Okay, my last suggestion for you in terms of the Find My Past site specifically is to really use the site to its fullest extent. Get the most out of all the collections that we've published. Um, every collection has some kind of collection description and an area for learning more about the, those records. Um, some of them may be very brief. Some of them may be quite complex, like the one you're looking at on the screen regarding airmen service records. This information is handcrafted, kind of cultivated from our team of experts. And in many cases, we really spend quite a bit of time on this part of the site. In most cases, you're going to have to scroll down to get to this information. But I, I said, I've said it before, I'm going to say it again. Always, always, always scroll down to find out what you're not seeing. 
So when it comes to this type of contextual information, um, you might find a glossary of terms that are used commonly across the records, right? In this case, they're military records. Um, if you're unfamiliar with British military, these are really essential terms to know about and essential information to have. Um, at the top of the page of the description of the collection, um, there's going to be a short description at the top uh, and links to the additional information towards the bottom of the screen. But then you also get the icon typically of the partner in which we worked with in order to get to those records. So in this case, it's in association with the National Archives, um, one of our premier partners that we're really, really proud to, to host their records. Um, and if you scroll down to the um, available record series or the, or the description of the records, you get this full description of all of the different collections of records that are that go into the British Army Service records that make up this kind of massive collection on Find My Past. These are all the individual pieces. And each one has some kind of a description attached. Um, the code at the beginning, WO2022, excuse me, is actually referencing the code that's used in the National Archives. So if you go to the National Archives website and you find the record in their material, here we have WO22 again, you might find even more contextual information, and even more helpful links and resources and references um, that they have cultivated and offered on their website as well. So make sure that you're tracking the record through its entire life, right? Look at it from point of its creation all the way through the process of, of it ended up ending up in your hands uh, to make sure that you understand the context of the record, what it's telling you, and everything you can glean from it. Okay, so we've talked a lot about how to manipulate the site. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk through um, the idea of searching versus researching. Now, a lot of us spend time on internet sites searching. So we're, we're putting in a name and maybe a date and a place, and we're hoping that the site will generate something back for us. I really would like to encourage you to think about researching very thoroughly and with intent. Um, the tools on Find My Past actually allow you to create that research plan and track your results pretty easily. And I talked about that through the session with the little check marks um, but, and, and the search all records page. All of that will help you build that research plan and keep it moving as you progress through your research. You want to make sure that you track new records that are added to these collections that are available online. Um, at Find My Pass, we add materials into existing record collections all the time. Um, so you want to make sure that you are able to keep up on that. And this is maybe not, you know, if you're if you're just looking for something really simple, right? If you, you just need the GRO index for this person uh, to be able to go order the record and you know exactly how to get to it, that's fine. That's really simple and straightforward. But if you're doing this kind of a more complex research project or attempting to answer a genealogical question, especially with indirect evidence, creating a plan, sticking to that plan is going to be very, very important for you. Otherwise you end up getting kind of lost and inundated with information. So I'm going to just going to give you a quick example. Um, this is actually a segment of my research plan for John Lawrence, the person I've been talking about for the last hour. Um, so I have identified my goal for John Lawrence and my research project. Um, it's pretty broad. Um, it's to determine if the stories that I have uh, that I have documented in these oral histories of John are true, partly true, or fabricated. That's my overall goal. Within each of that, within each part of that goal, I have a list of objectives. So these are small tasks that I need to accomplish in order to meet my goal. I anticipate that this project will take several months or years, um, ultimately, to actually s completely satisfy my my goal. So. Some of my goals include to confirm the birth date and location of John Lawrence, to confirm his parents, um, to confirm his siblings. Now, the oral history says he had one surviving adult sister, Anne King, and all other eight children in the family died in infancy. Um, I don't know if I'll ever, ever be able to prove that, but it is one of my objectives. And if you scroll down in my document, you'll find objectives for John's wife, his parents, and the circumstances in which um, his life is described. So I keep track of all of this. And the reason I do that is because when I sit down for research, which I don't get as much time to research, 
research as I would I would like, um, I might only have 45 minutes and I can go to this list and I can say, okay, today I'm really going to focus on point five, the marriage of John and Sarah Evans. What evidence do I have? What do I need to acquire? That's my goal for today's 45 minute session. And it keeps me on track and it keeps me motivated. Now, I do a lot of this using two primary tools. Um, I use a writing program um, called Scrivener, but you can easily use Microsoft Word or whatever whatever you have on your system. And I use Excel or a spreadsheet-based system. I'm going to show you a couple of snippets from my Excel spreadsheet. Um, I've been told that it's a little overwhelming, but I am very type A, and so I like to be organized. So just be aware of that moving in. Now, the first thing I'm going to show you is what I've referred to a couple of times over the course of this is to create a list of possible record sets. And this is what it looks like for, for me right now for John Lawrence. Um, so I have each of the major categories of records. So right at the top, you have all possible collections online that I can look for in vi for vital events, right? Birth, marriage, and death. I have the years of that record collection. Um, I have the name of the record collection, any notes that I might make, whether or not it's online. So in this example, you see a lot of family search material and find my past material and the date I last checked it. Uh, and what that means to me is that if I look back and I say, okay, I want to look in the band's collection again, I looked at it in June of 2020. I'm going to look at it again. If there's no additional updates, if there's no additional records added, I know I can just quickly move on in my list. But this allows me to track what each of the sites are doing and offering in terms of new records added to the collection. So I can keep on top of the possible sources until I satisfy the question. Um, you see a variety of other categories, land and property, um, occupation, because I think he was an apprentice maybe, right? All the lines in yellow are what I believe to be relatively accurate about the individual. And then everything below that is a possible record source. So it's a pretty thorough research log. Um, this is just one component of it. I have um, a research project workbook for every major project that I undertake. And each one has multiple tabs. This is always the first tab is what records can I possibly look at? The second tab is always the individual's timeline or the timeline of the family so that I know when and where I believe things to have happened. Um, I like to sort the data analytically depending on how I'm approaching, approaching the research question, which is one of the reasons why I keep it in Excel because I can sort all these columns to my preference. Um, and this is just one example, right? You're going to find your own way of doing these types of complicated research projects. You're going to find your own system. Mine just happens to include this list and happens to be in Excel. Another section of my research kind of project workbook and, and my research um, list is, um, is listing out all of the searches that I actually conduct. So, and I just gave you a couple of examples to keep this really simple, but um, if I go on to find my past and I've got 45 minutes, I'm actually going to document exactly what I put in the search boxes and what filters I use to conduct that search. And this, again, helps me track the number of results I'm getting back and any possible uh, possibility of new records. Um, again, some people call me far too detail-oriented, including my 11-year-old daughter. I'm okay with that. Um, but it's a system that I've built over the course of several years that allows me to really keep on top and stay organized. I think one of the things that bothers me the most is, you know, trying to go back into my notebook and, and filter through a bunch of pages worth of notes and not being able to find exactly how I got to this particular record. And this system prevents me from doing that now. So I record the exact filters I use, the number of results that I get back. And if I repeat this search in 12 months and that number of results has changed, I can easily tell that something's, something's different, right? Whether it's new materials in the collection or they changed their search algorithm on the website that I'm using or what have you, okay? Now I combine this part of my spreadsheet with the search results. So everything is correlated, right? The next step then is to actually document what you what you discover. So I did a search for John Lawrence and British Army Service records. I got four reasonable results back. Um, I have comments as to why I've discarded that result. You can see my result of in column K is either negative or undetermined in this case, um, because in most cases, these individuals were born too early and they couldn't possibly be John Horatio Lawrence that I'm looking for. But there is one as a possibility, right? The, um, fr uh, from the Army Deserters Collection from the 24th foot. He's about the right age, about the right place. 
Um, but all that's available online is an index. So I need to go back to the Family History Society that created that index and actually say, okay, where did this material come from? And, and is there any possibility of getting more information? This is directly tied to the list I just showed you. So let me put them next to each other and hopefully it all makes sense. So on the far side, and hopefully you guys can see that, each line in the top screen is numbered, right? N number two of my search correlates with number two on the second list down at the bottom um, that has the search results. So that's why there's that pink and yellow column in there. It's telling me that on my search, I conducted this search with these filters and this name to get to these results. So they exactly tie back and forth to each other. So during my research process, I'm constantly moving between these two tabs in my workbook and my writing software so that I can document the findings and, and write out my thoughts as I research. So um, one of the questions I'm seeing that just popped up from Josephine, how do you find who put the information together? Typically, that is included in the citation information, the details in the record as it's published on Find My Pass. So in that extra information segment on the screen, on if you scroll down, it should give you an indication of where that um, information came from. So just to kind of quickly reiterate, right, the, the number of results I get in my search directly correlates to the number of documents that I examine. And I'm going to go through each one of those search results line by line and document why I think it's a good match or it doesn't fit um, or something that I need to continue to research. So hopefully that makes sense to you guys. Okay, a couple key learnings just to walk through before we go back into Q&A and comments. Um, there are a variety of ways to search find my, the Find My Pass site um, to find the resources that you need. So take your time to really learn how the site is built and how it's structured so that you can use it to your best advantage. And I encourage you to do that actually for all major genealogy providers. It's important to know how the site functions so, and how the records are organized so that you can get the most out of the collection. Make sure that you're manipulating your filters and collection specific search terms to make the most of your time. Think about your research in different terms, right? I kind of hinted at that um, when I talked about the War of 1812 records. They're kind of hidden away in the British Army um, collection because that's where they come from, right? Is it's they're actually British military records. But in order for me as an American to find American records on a British based website, I need to think more like a British person, right? I need to recognize that War of 1812 is not referred to as the War of 1812 in England. It's part of the larger kind of Napoleonic Wars, and that's where it sits in that category on the site. Um, so I'm not going to find War of 1812 on Find My Past, but I am going to find Napoleonic Wars. So I got to kind of switch your gears a little bit and switch your thinking to make sure that you're kind of aligning with how the site is designed and developed. Certainly on Find My Past, do not expect thousands of re results. You can get them, of course, if you start very broad, but the system is really built for accuracy more than quantity. So we're, again, putting you in the driver's seat, trying to make sure that you can control your research. And then, of course, utilize the tree and hence upload your GEDCOM to Find My Past. Make sure that you're taking advantage of all the kind of the automated systems. Whether or not you choose to act on those hints is up to you. Um, but if you're, especially if you're unfamiliar with an area, the hints can be really useful in helping to point you to potentially new record sets. My last piece of advice, and I think you'll probably hear this um, from just about everybody that you talk to in genealogy, uh, is taken directly from a record that I thought for half a second or so was my guy. Um, and I was pretty excited to find this one, right? John Lawrence traveling um, into New York, which could have been the case around 30 years of age from Great Britain. He's a laborer. The time frame was about right. Unfortunately, it's not my guy. And so the name of the vessel is really important here. It's the try again. So I would encourage you to just simply keep trying on your research. Um, don't give up. Try a new filter. Try a new search combination. Try a new record set or a new resource. Go offline for a little while. Read a book. Um, learn more about that, that culture, that community, that occupation, whatever it is that's got you stuck. And go, then go back into the records with some new knowledge and just simply try again. I love this record. It's actually printed out on my desk. I keep it with me all the time. All right. So I know that there has been a lot of comments. Um, and I am going to stop screen sharing and go back to my normal size. All right. So let me just take a second to kind of reiterate a couple of really significant points that I, I'm hoping that you guys 
will actually walk away with today. Um, and I'm sure, sorry, I'm just trying to make sure things are arranged over here on my computer, so I'm talking to you. Um, I'm sure that there are a lot of comments and I hope that this has been helpful um, and beneficial to everybody. Um, just realizing how weird my hair looks right now. Okay, so first thought really is, you know, think about are you searching or are you researching, right? Are you making the most of your time? Do you have a plan? Um, are you really thinking about um, the question you're trying to answer and the objective you're trying to meet? How do you think about the research process that matters, right? The, the idea of going into the research process and actually trying to identify your goals and objectives and how the records were created in the first place really makes a difference. Um, it's important that you track your research. Um, create that research plan. Writing is really essential. Take the time to actually sit down every day and write out your thoughts. Um, I almost, it's almost journal-ish or narrative, I guess, um, the way I write out my research. I'm not writing it for anybody else but me at this point. Um, I've never thought about, you know, writing a book or doing anything like that. If I wanted to do something like that or if I wanted to blog about it, for example, I would go back and change the way I wrote that out. But I'm talking to myself, essentially, in that writing process. All right, let's look at a couple of the comments. Now, Audrey made a note about British military records that I think is really helpful. And this is kind of reinforces my idea about learning about the records and how they were created. She says that most British military records are not conflict specific. So the name of a particular war may not appear anywhere in the description. You need to look for categories like service records and medals and so forth. And that's that's exactly my point. Audrey, thank you so much for, for sending in that comment because it it, it shows very easily that you know, having a preconceived notion of where, why and when that record was created is not going to be useful for most of us. We need to understand why and when and where that record was created and for what purpose it exists, because it, it wasn't written down so that genealogists in 200 years could track their ancestors. I, I guarantee that. Um, <laughs> so um, let's see, I'm trying to see. It looks like we have so many comments. I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to get to all these, but we'll do our best. Um, okay, I'm in good company then. As I was talking to myself and researching. Yeah, Linda, absolutely. I'm gonna scroll back up to the top. Um, let's see. Beth says, or said right at the beginning, as she shared her tip, if I can't find someone on the census that should be on the census, I will search for another member of the household street and sometimes they'll appear. That's a great suggestion. Absolutely, Beth. Um, I also, and I actually don't know if they did this in England or not for the UK censuses. Maybe Audrey, maybe if you can answer this, I'm not sure. In the US, they have, um, before the censuses were available online in the early 90s, they created a census index and they published it in books. So you can go to the 1871 census for Philadelphia, pull that book of the index off the shelf and look at all of the Browns that are listed in Philadelphia in 1871 in the census. Um, and it doesn't matter where in Philadelphia they're located, all the Browns are listed together. And that I find is particularly helpful when you're looking for surname variants, um, uh, possibilities, you know, like John Lawrence, um, for example, was located in Erie, Pennsylvania, where there are seven or eight different locations in Pennsylvania with the town of Erie. Um, so I had to figure out which county that was referring to. Um, and I used those census indexes to help me with that. Now those are not available online anywhere and they're held usually at major repositories. So uh, the Library of Congress, the Family History Library in Salt Lake City, those kinds of locations. Again, I'm not sure if they do anything like that equivalent for the UK. I would have to imagine something existed um, before the internet was developed. Um, but those can be particularly helpful as well for finding someone on a census that you think should be there but are, is not showing up. Um, okay, let's see. Um, Jenny commented at some point that the 1939 records were updated with names, dates, occupations, but was done in a hurry and not a pure census. Yeah, absolutely correct. 1939 register is not actually a census. Um, Hillary and a couple others looks like are commenting on the search radius tool. Um, I love the location bar. I like using the radius tool. Uh, Amanda said, I use the miles location all the time for parish records and wills. It's very useful. I totally agree. Um, I can't wait to expand that tool and see what else we can do with it. Um, 
Okay, let's see. Um, uh, lots of corrections on my pronunciation. Thank you very much again. <laughs> um, this one, now this one, I hope everybody caught this. Maps at Family Search is brill, brilliant, Sue, uh, especially for London parishes, but I hadn't been able to make it work in the last couple of years. You're right. Um, for a while, they took it down, and this is maps.familysearch.org is what we're referring to, and I showed this during the session. Um, they did take it down for a little while, um, but we, I, I don't really know if they listened to us or not, but we um, told them a number of times that really, really need to put that back up, and thankfully, they listened to the community, and they did republish it. I think that happened... Um, sometime last summer. Um, so it hasn't been very long that it's been accessible again, but I'm, I'm totally excited that it's back. Uh, Amanda says she uses the asterisk wildcard all the time. That's wonderful. That's really, really good. Uh, this is a good comment from Bath. Trying to keep track when place, places change counties can be frustrating, trying to guess or know which county they are or were in at a certain time. And I think that's really true. And it happens everywhere that uses kind of this organizational system for their municipalities. Um, it's, um, it's useful to kind of grab old maps, gazetteers, anything that you can find. Now, when I collect maps for a research project, I don't care what the year was that they made the map. If it is a map of the location I'm interested in, um, I'm interested in that map because every map is useful for some reason. There are also um, websites that will walk you through the county changes, like county border changes. I know that that's available for the United States. I don't know for England and Wales um, if there's a tool like that. I'm sure there must be, but there are tools for the U.S. that will actually kind of plays it out for you as a little video. So you can see at what year the county border changed um, and how it affected possible record keeping. Um, so you look for those kinds of assets across the internet. Um, okay, let's see. Okay. Um, just scrolling through the comments, so bear with me here. <laughs> Audrey referring to the 1939 register saying, read it. I wrote some of it, <laughs> the area codes. Audrey, you're such a great asset to the genealogy community. Thank you so much. Um, okay, let's see. I'm still scrolling. So, oh, Flo, she's with me. Excel is my best friend in researching my ancestors. I'm telling you, if someone would develop a software tool that incorporated all the genealogy stuff, um, plus kind of academic research tools plus Excel and Word all in one big piece of software. It'd be hugely expensive, um, but it would be so worth it. I would love that. Um, that would be so great. Um, okay, so Mary says, and I think this is in the category in the section when I was looking at my, um, when I was showing you my Excel research log. Do you retype all this information? Yeah, actually, Mary, I do. Um, and it, it is time consuming, um, obviously, and it's very manual process. But I find that when I retype how um, a record is indexed, for example, especially with a, when you're talking about something like an alternate spelling or um, a time period that you're not as familiar with, I find it's very helpful for me to actually have to manually type it. It makes me think about what I'm putting into the computer, what I'm putting into my document. Um, so if the name is spelled differently and I've never thought about that variation, I can go, oh, now, wait a second. I need to add that to my research list, to my task list to make sure that I'm actually looking at all of the collections with this alternate spelling because I didn't think about this one before. Um, it helps me to um, be more aware, I guess, be more present in the moment, right? It's very easy as genealogists, I think, for us to get so excited about a new find or a new discovery that we just kind of, yes, we want to celebrate and do the dance and that's all great. But then we forget to actually go back and really carefully analyze that document or that discovery. And so manually typing it into my research log actually slows me down and makes me more aware of what I'm looking at, what I'm doing. Helps my analysis process, I guess. Um, okay. 
Uh, Amanda, this is quite a comment. Let me read this. Another thing I do, which has helped me in search engines, especially Google, is the quotation marks. Absolutely. Discovered an original handwritten document from my five times great grandfather had been on sale on eBay. Oh, too late to buy it. That's too bad. But I could see the document it has to do with his grandmother. Help me to crack a brick wall. That's such a great story, Amanda. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, and I totally agree, right? The search engines have a completely different structure. If you don't know how to properly conduct a search on Google, um, there are webinars and lessons available on that as well. Using search engines properly is really, really important when you move into kind of the bigger picture of the internet. Um, I will also comment that I also found an item for sale on eBay at one point in my life from an ancestor. I was also too late to buy it. Um, Thankfully, though, my second cousin bought it. Um, he actually, we were bidding on it at the same time, and we didn't know that. Um, and um, and he has decided that since he won, he will leave it to me in his will. So that'll be fun. Um, <laughs> all right, let me. I think that um, covers a lot. Oh, Audrey has one last tip. Let's put this one on the screen. This is so great. The Association of British County Site is very useful to help you understand place names and boundary changes as a very good gazetteer. That is fantastic. I'm actually going to write this one down because I don't think I am familiar with this site yet. So abcounties.com. If you're not making note of it right now, as you all should be, like me on my post-it note, abcounties.com, make sure that you take advantage of the sharing and the resources um, that the community is all posting. So thank you very much, Audrey, for that. That's fantastic. All right. I think that we are um, just, I mean, I know we're over our hour, um, but I want to just make sure that everybody has enjoyed this. Um, we appreciate you being with us. Um, we appreciate you attending our sessions. Um, I know later this week on Friday, we have our usual Find My Past Fridays update. Um, that would be a good one next week. I'm particularly excited about um, just to give everybody a little sneak, uh, sneak peek, I guess. Um, but thank you very much for joining with us. Um, if you have further questions, you can always post them on the Facebook page, and eventually they will get back to me. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions, particularly about kind of the research log and my processes. Um, um, but I didn't want to overwhelm anybody. So if um, the suggestions that I've shared have been helpful, I'd really like to know that. If you have feedback on this particular session, I'd be really interested in hearing what you have to say, what you thought about all this. Um, if there are areas of the site that you want us to dig down into further in future sessions, let us know that as well. Um, we really appreciate your comments and your feedback and your suggestions for these types of sessions. Um, we really enjoy doing them, so we hope that you are getting as much out of them as we are putting into it. Thank you all so much for being with us. Um, it's wonderful to see everybody from kind of around the world. It's so, so great to be with the community. And we will end it there. Um, and we'll see you back on Friday for Find My Past Friday. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day wherever you are. Stay safe. <laughs>